What is up, everybody? I am Phantom Darkness 135. So, two big things that people have been pressing for for the last few months have been one, to do more console games, which we started now that we got our capture card, and two, for more programming tutorials, since you guys really seem to enjoy the uh, Python game tutorial, especially, and the C uh, YouTube tool thing we did. And I'm really happy to see that. I'm really happy so many people are getting into programming. So today, we're going to do a little tinkering with Perl. I've just recently gotten interested in Perl, and I love it so far. Um, for those of you who don't know, Perl is a programming language suitable for writing simple scripts as well as complex applications. That was a good description and convenient. Um, for me, I would say it's a language that does a lot of stuff with a little code, and it does it really well. It's very efficient, and it's a little ugly but it, it runs well, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a little hard to read sometimes, but very, very cool to use, and uh, probably one of my favorite languages I've learned so far. So this tutorial of the day, if you're experienced with Perl, you're probably going to just scoff at my coding, but it's, it's okay. This tutorial is simply the basics, so there's a lot of stuff that I'm not going to include, and the stuff that I do include is going to be watered down a shade just so everybody even if you've never programmed before can understand so that being said we're going to start with how to download Perl for Windows I, I'm sorry I only have a Windows machine here but it is available for um, Mac and Unix and Linux as well of course and you can get that through Strawberry Perl for Windows or Active Perl for Windows or Mac or uh, Linux so I'm going to start with how to install Perl and how to install the text editor VIM for Windows since um, it doesn't come with a VI uh, editor. And you'll see what that is. If you're just totally confused right now, don't worry, I'll explain everything. But what I'm getting to is I'm going to put an annotation up and if you don't want to see how to install this or if you already have Perl installed, you can skip ahead to where the actual programming begins. All right. All right. So if you're looking to install Perl for the first time, all you got to do, go to strawberryperl.com. Download for your version of Windows 32 or 64. Make sure you get the right one. That's that. And you need a text editor. You can use Notepad, but it's a lot easier to use this VIM, the editor. It, it's a, well, I won't go into the details of it. It's just a text editor that helps you program. So you can go to vim.org slash download.php, and I'll put all these links in the um, description for this video. And do the self-installing executable. And as you can see, it's for all operating systems, platforms, etc. And it will install itself right where it needs to be. And then after you do that, sorry, I just have a few more tabs open for later. You need to go to your computer, right click, properties, advanced system settings, environment variables. And then you need to either edit or add a few. If you don't see the name there, you need to add home and then point it to wherever your Vim folder downloaded to. Mine's in program files. And then your path variable, I think, should be there already. So you need to add two things to this. One, you need to add wherever your strawberry pearl bin went, and then wherever your vim74 file is. So this is where, let me go ahead and show you where this ends up. So this is what the 74 file looks like. It's in my program files. So you need to add those two, separated by a semicolon, very important, into your path variable. And then don't worry about these two. These are just for my personal use. And then the final one you need to do is make a new one called Vim and point it to that same folder, Vim74. All right, and that should be enable you to use all of these from the command line. So on Windows, if you press the Windows key and R, you'll get the run box up and you can type in CMD. Alternatively, you can just search for CMD or if you're on Windows 8, you can just type in CMD and it will come up. That's the command line. And everything you do with Perl basically can be run for the command line. So I'm going to be working in here a lot. Makes it feel like a real hacker when you see the green text on the black background and everything. So the command I just gave was change directory to Perl. And that's just giving me where the uh, files I'm going to be using are located. So I'm going to just make a new one. I have it written already, but I'm going to make a new one. And actually, let me take a look. So when you're using Vim, all you need to do to open it up in Vim is just put the command vim subscriber or vim I just call it vim just because it's easier subscribe I think I named it 
So this is the program we're going to write, and I'm going to write it again. As you can see, it's very short, so we shouldn't have any trouble with it. I am going to copy this down because I don't want to really type that again. So when you're using Vim, if you press, uh, let's see, don't want to do that. Stop it. Need to copy this, and that's all I want to do. All right, so when you're using Vim, you press Escape, or when you first open it, you'll be like this. If you press the letter A, you can edit it and do whatever you want. And then once you're done, press Escape, and then colon W will write the file, and then colon Q will quit. So you're back here. So we're going to make a new one. We'll just call it new.pl. That just means Perl program. And that lets Vim know that it will highlight text in different colors based on what the text says. So what I'm going to show you how to do today, this is the actual programming starting now. What, I'm going to, what we're going to do today is make a program that will alphabetize your YouTube subscriber list. I don't know why you would ever need to do that, but it's just showcasing some of the things you can do with Perl. And uh, it makes it very, very easy compared to other languages. Now, one use I did make of this is I made an app that would calculate my grade averages from the website that my university uses for their grade. So you can use it for stuff like that. But today we're going to keep it simple and we're going to use it to alphabetize our subscriber list on YouTube. So I'm going to log in. I have my... Oops, I forgot to delete that. It's part of the program, all right? This is my Google page that they made me get. So I'm going to log in with that. And then I'm going to navigate to youtube.com slash subscribers. And you can see all my subs here, or most of them. Here's the rub. You have to keep clicking load more. I haven't found a better way to do this yet. But if you want to get every single one of your subscribers, you need to keep clicking this until you get all of them. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do the first few. So what we're going to do, and there's two ways to do this. I'm going to show you the easy way, and then a little more complex way that's pretty cool. So the first way, if you're in Chrome, you need Chrome or an extension for Firefox to do this. View page source, and you get the HTML for this page, for the subscriber page. So we're going to copy this down. I'm going to put this in the file. I already had it in there. Well, we're going to pretend that wasn't there. We're going to copy it into a file called YouTube.txt, wherever you want to put it. Save it. All right, now we can begin writing our Perl program. So I'm going to press A and VIM. That creates this to insert. I just pointed with my finger. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right here, you can see this is insert. That means we're ready to go. This first line I'm going to include is really for Unix. Uh, not really only. It, it's complicated, but just for good practice, you should put this line. And this dash W here just puts warnings on. So if we do something wrong, the uh, command line will tell us what we did wrong, or it will try to tell us. So we don't really need to include anything else besides that line before that line. The first thing we're going to do is open a file, what's called a file handle. So I'm just going to name it FH for file handle. And it's just a variable that holds a file and acts as a little input output for your file. So we're going to point it to wherever that YouTube document was. It was in, uh, I think it's in my downloads. So what we'll do is we'll copy that. And you want to put, there's a couple different ways to do this. You can do this way, where we're going to be putting in output. We're going to be outputting from the file, so we need, that's the output operator. And then I'm going to edit and paste that path in. And because the backslash is a special character, you need to do two backslashes so that the compiler knows that you're talking about an actual backslash and not the special character. So two backslashes for each. Blah. And then add the YouTube.txt so it notes that. So that's one way to do that. That's one way to open your file. The other way, I'll put it in in a in a Perl. Oops, I forgot my other quote. Eh, there we go. In Perl, you can also um, the comments or the hashtag symbol, and you can also do it like this. This is also the preferred way to do it, really. But for now, we're going to use this. You specify what your the file name or the blah, the file handle name, and then what kind of, this is the output symbol, this is the input, and then there's also a append and some other ones. We're going to do output, and then another comma, and then we give it that path there, copy that here. So I'm just going to put path, 
and you can also do it that way. We'll use that way a little later. But for now we're going to keep it simple, stupid, K-I-S-S, -S, and open file handle and tell it which file to open. Now that we've done that, we're going to start a while loop. We're going to say a while file handle. That basically means until the file is ended, until it's completely done, we're going to keep running through it. And then we're going to say if, and we're going to use something called the match operator. Now by default you can save a little space and just write this. Um, we should probably put something. So what that is saying is if you see the phrase href equals quote mark, then do something. And basically, so we're running through the file, we're looking for that specific phrase. But since we're going to be looking for web addresses that have lots of forward slash in, forward slashes in them, we're going to add an M. And then once you add that M with the match operator, you can use any punctuation mark to mark the end of the phrase. You can use a semicolon. You can use a percent sign. They all mean the same exact thing. I'm going to use curly brackets. So. Now we need to find the phrase that we want to look for so that we can get the names of our subscribers. So let me take Lime Green Elevator since he's a nice fan. And we're going to look at the source page on Chrome or in your text document. You can search for, actually let's do it from the text document. Let's open that up directly. So we're going to search for his name. All right, there's the first time. Okay, so if we want to get to get the name of a subscriber, we need to find this phrase. Ah, I lost it. Followed by this is what we were trying to get between these two caret marks here. We want that name, but we want it for all of the subscribers, not just Lime Green Elevator. So what we're going to do is we're going to say look for the phrase. So let's see here. What do we want to do here? Oh, I had it pasted, didn't I? Let's just do that. Oh, I erased it. All right, we'll do it from scratch. Oop. All right. So we'll say, look for the phrase, phrase <laughs> uh, href equals slash user. But the thing is, we can't just use Lime Green Elevator's name. We want anyone's name. So what we're going to do is use the dot operator. And what that does is it looks for any character at all, except for a new line, but don't worry about that. And we want any character, but we want any characters, not just one character. So we're going to put the, well, it looks like the time symbol, but it's actually a uh, quantifier that says, look for that dot zero or more times. So we're looking for any character zero or more times. If I put A like that, it would look for href equals, quote, user slash A, or user slash AAA, or user slash AAA or user slash nothing because it's zero or more time. So if A shows up there or not, it's going to do that. But we want to do that for any character. So look for any character in there any number of times. You can also use plus for one or more times, but we won't worry about that. We want any characters there, even if there are none there. So we'll use that operator, those two operators, and we also want to put a question mark. And what that does is it stops it at the first quote. So we want anything, as you can see right here, we just went up to this first quote. If I didn't have that question mark there, it would look for the very last quote in this entire document, and then it would put everything in between that phrase we just looked at. Oh, I lost it. There it is. It would put everything between here and whatever the last quote is on the thing. So we don't want that. So we put the question mark there, and that makes it stop at the first quote it comes across. So that's the first part, and if we look at the next part, let's see, where is it? Okay, so the next thing we see is that there's some space in between that and the first caret. So to capture any amount of space, we can use something called a character class. And what we do is we put a square bracket, backslash s, that means any kind of space, a space, a new line, or a tab, or anything. But we don't just want just one, we want any amount. So we'll put the star again. We'll close the bracket. We'll put the caret there. And then we have some more space. So we'll put any space again. Put the end bracket. 
and then we want to capture the actual name itself but we want to save that because we're going to put it into a list of all the subscribers we have so we're going to put parentheses around this one very important that captures whatever's in this little operator so if we put the parentheses we use the dot operator so any old junk between that caret and the next caret but there's also some space there so we we'll add another one of these so any old junk between that and the other caret and then we'll just add this you probably don't need to add this but for safekeeping we'll put the slash a in there and then that will do it for our phrase that we want to match so out of the only thing we're capturing here is whatever's in that parentheses right there those parentheses I guess I should say so if we encounter something like that we want to put it into a list and all we need to do for that is push is a command that just means put this on the list we'll name our list subscribers push subscribers and then a comma we'll put the this is a weird thing it's a variable that Perl uses it's a dollar sign and a one and that just means the first thing that's in parentheses if I put uh, let's say if I would put this in parentheses, I wouldn't need to, but if I did, all you need to do is change this to a 2 because it's the next one. Sorry, my phone was buzzing. But we're not going to do that. We're going to leave that alone. Just like that. So the cool thing about Perl is you don't need to, like in C++, if you wanted to declare a list or any kind of object, you'd put, like for an integer, you'd put int test or whatever and that's how you declare a variable. In Perl, you can declare a variable or a list, which is the at symbol. A variable is with the dollar sign symbol. You can declare it right on the same line. So we don't have to declare subscribers. We can just put it right there, and Perl will know what we're trying to do. So it creates the list of subscribers. And then once we're done with the file, we're going to close it. So fh is actually a variable, but I call it a file handle because it has a, it's acting as a file handle. So once we have our list, it's very easy to get a sorted list of all our subscribers using Perl. All we have to do is put print, uh, let's see, how do we want to phrase this? We'll put print, oh, I know what we want to do. For each, we'll say for each item in subscribers, we're going to print, and there's another special Perl variable, the dollar sign and the underscore. And what that means is the item in the list, whatever's being referred to by this for each. So if we wanted to put for each subscriber, we could make a variable called subscriber, and then just put subscriber, print subscriber. And that means for each subscriber in the list, subscribers, print that subscriber. But instead, we're going to save some space and use the dollar sign on under, underscore. Now, I told you Perl is really weird and ugly looking sometimes. This is exactly what I was talking about. But say we wanted it, which is probably more appropriate, on a new line. We want each subscriber on a new line. So what we're going to do is put a quote mark. Make sure it's double quotes because you can't put a new line in single quotes. That's the reason. And we can put our variable name right in there and then just add the backslash n. That's a new line. Then make sure you get your semicolons. So that'll put every subscriber on a new line for us right on the console screen. So let's see if we did everything right. We're going to press escape. We're going to put a colon W in Vim, colon Q. And then to um, run any Perl program, all you got to put once you download Strawberry Perl is Perl new.pl. Okay, so let's see what we did wrong here. Oh, did I not take that out? Uh, I think I put the wrong list name is what I did. So, subscriber. Yep. Okay. We need to take this out. That's why we put the dash W on is because the command line can, can then tell us what we did wrong. All right. So, we did something wrong, too, with the phrase it looks like. So, let me see. Subscribe. I think this is the one. Yes. Okay. So, this is the phrase I use. Let's copy it over and see what I missed here. Oh, I did something completely different, actually. We're going to use that way instead. That's much shorter. So we're going to vim our new one. Okay, I want to keep that there. I don't know why I closed it after I did this. So for each subscriber, 
So let's replace this. Let's see what the difference is first. What did we what did we mess up here? Oh, let me put it in quotes. Okay. So href user. Da, da, da. Oh, aha. We need to put the star outside of these brackets or else we're going to mess up. So let's do that. Oh, and we forgot I need to add a question mark here so that it doesn't try to take everything in between this caret and the final caret over here. So we'll change those two things. And now we should be good to go. And I forgot to sort the list. The thing is, with C++, you'd have to write your own function for sorting or use one of the library ones. Well, for Perl, you can just say for each sort. And what I did in the other file to make it a little shorter is just put this all on the same line. So we're going to put it all right up here. Should do the exact same thing. So let's try that one. So we're going to Perl new.pl. There we go. So now we have an alphabetized list of all the subscribers on that page. Now this little code you're seeing there in Terminator's channel, that's the, uh, I think it's the ASCII code or the whatever code for the apostrophe. So it might come out a little weird. Just know that you probably have a punctuation, punctuation mark there that um, it's not recognizing. So that's all that is. But there you go. There's all these subscribers. Now, if you want to know a cooler way to do it, we don't even need the text file. All we need to do is let me open, uh, let me sign out of here and we'll try this again. So if we go to youtube.com slash subscribers, um, let me go ahead and remove my account so it's like it's not even there. There we go. If we view the source for this page, and go down to, actually I want uh, login. We can see that this form right here has a name in HTML, GAIA underscore login form. And then each of these, the email and the password is, where is it at? Uh, right here. So it's called email and passwd. And another way to do this, so I'm gonna clear this and I'm not going to write this with you because it's going to take a long time, but I'll show you the program I wrote to do this another way. Is you can use something called modules in Perl. And basically, they're sort of like libraries in C or Python. And what they are is code that someone else has written for you that you can use, and it makes things very easy. So we have three modules here we have the mechanized module, the HTTP cookies module, the file temp module. And don't worry about any of this. All this does is just makes it so that I can say this, and the interpreter will read that as make a new one of these. So don't worry about that. So the mechanize module is sort of like a simulated web browser. So what we do is we make a variable called mech. We make a new mechanize object. And for this, the cookies, the only reason we need that is so that we can store any cookies that the session uses into the cookie jar, as they call it. So we make a new cookie jar thing. The temp file is used to make a temporary file so you don't actually make a notepad file on someone's computer if you were to release this to someone else. So we're just going to make a temporary file. And so we put the file and file name variables in parentheses separated by a comma equals temp file, make sure you get the parentheses. And what that does is it assigns file as a file handle, the file a temporary file using this file name. It just generates a random file name. And then I have a prompt here, print email, enter email, whatever. The chomp function in Perl, all that does is takes out any new line characters. So if your user accidentally enters a new line or something, you can just take out the new line. It just takes whatever's from input. So we're putting whatever the user inputs into the variable email. Same thing with password. This command right here, I just put it in here. It clears the screen. And the only reason I did that is because not that I don't trust you guys, but I don't want you seeing my password when I type it in. So I clear the screen so I can cut that out. Now, once we use the mechanize object, we use mech, and then it looks like an arrow. It's a dash in the caret, get, and we say this URL right here. Well, what it was, so 
if I type in subscribers, this is what it gets me to. If it fails, I have it print a little message there. That's just if we did something wrong. And then we say mech arrow form name. And that's where this ID comes in. G-A-I-A -A, login form. And then for the field, email, make sure you put whatever's in this ID, which is email. And then this ID for the password is password. And we're just putting into those fields whatever the user told us up here. So we get the email and password from the user. We put it in the fields by itself. And then it does a simulated click right here. So you use the click function. And then we need to get back in case it went to another page or you had to, if it, if it asked you or if YouTube had a pop-up or something, I use mech.get again on the same URL and the same print fail if it failed. And right here, we're going to open our temporary file. And what this, uh, this is the format I was showing you that more people aren't used to, except we didn't have this encoding line here. And the reason we put that there is so Perl knows what encoding it's supposed to read in that file, because otherwise it doesn't know if this is ASCII or UTF or whatever. Um, don't worry about all that. That's just more detailed stuff. So we're going to print to the file mech arrow content. So basically, it's just getting this page. So if we viewed the page source, it's getting this, all of this, or I'm sorry, it's after we actually log in. So let me put my, whatever my email and password is. Okay, so it's getting the same page that we saved to a text file in the last program, and it's putting it in that temporary file, so you don't have to actually store it on your computer. And then anytime you're done, and take note that this is the input now, not the output, and anytime you do something to a file, you want to close it, otherwise you might lose whatever you just wrote to the file. So, here's our original program. All we have to do is open the temporary file, do the exact same thing we did in the other program, and then the only reason I included this is just so if you ran this as a standalone like executable, you would it would run and then it would immediately close out so that you couldn't even see whatever the subscriber list was. It would just close out of the program as soon as it was finished with all this. So what this does is it just waits for the user to enter any key before it exits the program. Ugh, my mouth is so dry. <laughs> Alright, so this is the second way to do it. And I'll show you how to use these modules in a second. But for now, we're going to... Why are you yelling at me? Oops, I accidentally typed an A. Eh. Okay, let's get out of here. I don't care. Okay, so if we run this one... I'm going to enter my email, which I think I still have copied in my clipboard if I didn't change anything else. Yep. Okay, and then I'm going to enter my password. And it's going to clear the screen, and I'm going to cut away for just a millisecond, just so you guys don't see my password. One second. Clear screen is executed, and now it's a blank screen. It's opening all, it's trying to contact the web page, and there you go. Without even opening a web browser, we could get all of our subscribers, or most of them, the first set of them in a sorted order. So that's how you do that. And then it was waiting for me to enter a key. So let's look back at this. These modules here, they don't come with Strawberry Pearl. Some of them might, but you're not, it's not guaranteed that they come with Strawberry Pearl. So what we want to do is once you download Strawberry Pearl, it's really easy to download modules. I'm going to clear this real fast. You give the command cpan, which is the website that holds, let me show you what that is holds Comprehensive Pearl Archive Network. That's what it stands for. It holds all these modules that people have made for you to use. It's awesome. So you write the command cpan, c c -span, install, and say I wanted the mechanized module. So I'd install that. I'm not going to install because I already have it already. Um, say you wanted to I'm not going to click enter because I already have it installed and I don't want to do that. But you can do that for each of those modules that we use, so HTTP cookies, and it will find it for you, and it will install it right to your computer so you don't have to do anything else. 
So do that for each of these. And you don't need this QW. All that is is saying you can place a word. If you don't want to include that, so if I took this out, and I said file temp new, it's the exact same thing. However, it's much easier to just put QW temp file. There we go. And I need to add it down here. So that is Perl. Two ways to do it. Here's the first program again. Very easy. It's a lot easier if you just go here, right click, view page source, and then just select all, copy and paste into a text. You can do it right there. But if you want to get fancy, you can do it the other way. And do it all without. So if I close out all this web browsing stuff, oh, hi Audacity. And I'll copy this again. If you do it this way, enter password or email. I'll cut away again. So now it's reading it. it does all of it, and we didn't even have to open a web browser. Okay, so say you want to make an executable out of your Perl file. So all you have to do is put cpan install par packer. And that's a module that lets you, uh, it's sort of like a compiler for Perl. It lets you make your Perl programs into executable files. Now I'm not going to in uh, install this because I already have it. And two, it takes forever to install. So you're going to have to wait a while to install it. But once you do that, you put the command pp and then subscriber or let's do the other one let's do um, new.pl and then the dash o command just says you can name it like uh, subscriber.exe and then I'm gonna put this in my downloads actually so can I do that actually we'll just leave it there we'll just leave it well enough alone so it will take a few minutes okay so it took about a minute and now the exe file is right here now we can run it. Oops. See, here's the thing is we didn't put that at the end of this. We need to put just wait for that little keystroke before we quit. So we'll do that. We'll run it again. Okay, so now we should be able to stop it. So it's reading from the same file and there it is. So that gets your own little uh, executable from your Perl script. If you wanted to do that on the other file, you would need to include a couple other things that it really gets a little complex when you start working with web pages. So I'm not going to do that. But as far as getting started, I hope this has helped you out with Perl. I definitely recommend uh, checking out perlmonks.com if you have questions or if you just want to learn more about Perl itself. And the book I'm reading uh, is the O'Reilly book, Learning Perl. 6th edition for me and uh, if you want to get more into Perl and want to check it out definitely recommend it. For those of you just starting out programming though you might want to start with another programming language as, as you can see Perl gets really messy really fast. Alright guys that does it for this tutorial if I, what did I just type? <laughs> that does it for this tutorial I am Phantom Darkness 135 I need to go get a drink of water I thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed I am out of here. See you guys.